Hello and welcome to an overview of TSW or topical steroid withdrawal. I'd like to give a very special thank you to everyone who has so kind and contributed their photos towards this. Here are the topics that we'll be discussing in this video. Viewer discretion is advised as there are graphic images that some may find upsetting. So my name is Hibba, I've been in withdrawal from hydrocortisone creams and then protopic since June 2017. I'm a dentist, I have a previous degree in biomedical science and both of my parents are medical doctors. I started out with mild childhood eczema and then we were given low dose hydrocortisone creams which we used correctly, my mum is a GP, and then I ended up getting spreading eczematous rashes that didn't look like my original eczema. The GP gave us more hydrocortisone and then over the course of 15 years I used it on and off until I got to medium potency hydrocortisone and then I had even worse spreading rashes and it looked like an allergic reaction to the steroids. So my doctors took me off the steroids and they put me on Protopic, which is a non-steroidal immunosuppressant. And I used that on and off for 10 years, but that also gave me side effects. So the last time I used steroids was in 2007. The last time I used Protopic was 2017. And that began my body going into a slow and severe full body withdrawal. I was bed bound for four months, house bound for two years, and then almost two years after stopping it, I was diagnosed officially as having topical steroid withdrawal, even though it had been more than a decade. That was explained by the fact that Protopic had actually stopped my body from being able to go into withdrawal. And so once I stopped everything, that's when I was able to withdraw completely. Currently, I'm about 40 months into withdrawal and I'm about 80% recovery. So corticosteroids are synthetic steroids which mimic the body's natural anti-inflammatory properties. You can find them in topical forms and in other forms. Topical steroid creams are usually used for things like eczema. They were introduced into medicine in the 1950s. The idea of TSW was introduced in 1970s, but today it's largely dismissed and unrecognised. The problem with TSW is that it can mimic eczema. It can go under the radar while you're still using steroids and sometimes it takes a long time before it's actually diagnosable. So this is why the current statistic that we have of 10 to 15% of people developing TSW is likely to be inaccurate. There's little funding currently put towards studying TSW. However, the funding is put towards producing new drugs to try to counteract the effects of TSW. However, every drug does come with risks and side effects. And as I found out with the protopic, some can even delay and add symptoms on top of the corticosteroid withdrawal. This is what TSW can look like. Some terminology that you will hear around this topic is topical steroid addiction, red skin syndrome, and topical steroid withdrawal. Steroid withdrawal can occur also from non-topical corticosteroids and it can present like TSW. So that's just for you to bear in mind when we use this term. It can include non-topical as well as topical steroids. Here's what an early stage of TSW can look like. And then at its later stage, it can be quite severe and it can be very debilitating for people, leaving them bed bound for months. So the name red skin syndrome might give the impression that it's just a bit of red skin, but here's a snippet of what's gonna come later in the symptom gallery. And as you can see, it's a lot more than just red skin. The withdrawal process is different for everyone. On average, it does take between months to years to complete recovery. Not everyone will get every symptom. Symptoms can be, they can vary in severity and in location on the body. But for most people, it will be severely debilitating for some of the time during their withdrawal at some point. But for other parts, they can find that they are quite functional. As with lots of things, it's not a linear healing process. You can be a fast burner or a slow burner. Different body parts can heal at different times. I've got a picture here to show you one side can be worse than the other, but for the most part, everybody will have flares. Some of them can last for months until eventually at the end of withdrawal, you no longer experience any flares. The early stages of TSW can be confusing because as you can see in this photo, it doesn't actually look like anything more than a bit of irritation, a bit of redness, a few little bumps is happening. But as time passes, and the withdrawal develops, you can see all of the changes that happen to the body and the skin. It can also mimic other conditions such as keratosis pilaris, but again, once it's left over a period of time, it starts to behave very differently. So you can see that it's actually something different. Here's another version of what early stage TSW can look like. And you can see why it's commonly misdiagnosed as eczema. 
In these early stages, steroids will be applied to manage or to control the symptoms while it's not yet understood that it's TSW. It only provides temporary relief and then the symptoms will persist and worsen and spread. The steroids will become less effective as the symptoms worsen and then you'll find areas that weren't previously affected by the original skin condition starting to get covered. Then you'll need to use stronger steroids and maybe even non-steroidal medication. So if you cast your eyes to the bottom right, you can see on this little girl's shoulder, she's got some bumps here, which can actually indicate an early TSW flare. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when these bumps do progress from early stage TSW into a full on flare. So you can see these bumps here in the ankles. And then as the withdrawal progresses, you can see more severe symptoms developing. It can be quite shocking until eventually the flare does start to calm. The treatments available, we've already discussed topical steroids. We've even got immunosuppressants such as the Protopic, Eucrisa, and recently Dupixent. These all focus on suppression. You'll hear it a lot in the doctor's office. We need to get it under control. We need to manage it. Why do some people end up in a steroid cycle or medication cycle for years when the guidelines state that the maximum dose, the maximum days that you should be using it is seven? There's a line that says, unless the physician directs otherwise. And so because of all the reasons we've already discussed, when it's considered to be eczema, and if it looks like the steroid creams are working to help the eczema, to provide relief, that's why people can end up getting prescribed the same creams for years on end, even though it can take just weeks for the body to go into TSW. This is what eczema looks like. The side effects of the treatment, which is the topical steroids, can include making the original skin condition worse and spreading. So essentially, if you put steroids on eczema, you can create eczema on steroids. This is what it can look like. Again, it can mimic and worsen. It looks like worsening eczema. This can even happen in people who haven't had any history of eczema. So people who have used topical steroids for things like an insect bite, who've used it for sunburn, who've used it for cosmetic reasons, or who've applied it for their children and they themselves do not have a history of having had eczema. But then once you've let the withdrawal take its course, you can see over time that it starts to clear by itself. Here are some other examples of eczematous type rashes in TSW clearing without any medication. So here are just some examples of when people have ended up in TSW because they've used topical and non-topical steroids for these different reasons. It doesn't help that we are surrounded by hidden steroids in creams that tout themselves as being herbal and natural and good for you. Sometimes they'll even have big letters saying steroid free. They'll call themselves things like miracle creams, but when tested, they're found to have things like clobetazole or propionate, which is not only a steroid, but it's a super potent steroid. So it's very dangerous to be using it in such high amounts, especially because it's unregulated. There have also been lawsuits filed against quite high end uh, skincare companies because their customers have found that after using certain creams of theirs they ended up going through debilitating withdrawal symptoms and they were found to have had hidden steroids that they didn't disclose and didn't put on the ingredients label. So the first thing that we normally get told by the doctors when they give us the steroids is if you use this for a long time it can thin the skin. So this is what that looks like. On the right you can see on the top this is what somebody's skin looks like normally without ever having used steroids. After just two weeks of using steroids, the bottom image shows how much the skin has thinned. You can imagine how much it can look, how, how, how thin it can get after years of using steroids. Another part of atrophy is lichenification, elephant skin. And this is thickening and deep wrinkling of the skin. It is temporary. And as you can see on the bottom right, it does resolve upon recovery. And there's some more examples on the next screen. Extreme dryness, shedding, flaking, tightness, cracking and peeling is all something to be expected in TSW with no exaggeration. You can see the footprints in the photo on the left, surrounded by skin flakes. You can see in the other photos, skin flakes can be small, they can be large. There's lots of dryness. It can be quite severe flaking as well. And interestingly, if you have a look at the images on the right, although the skin looks drier in the first image, there's a six month difference between the first and second photo and no moisturizers were used at all during this entire period of time. Yet the skin looks more moisturized. 
and here's just some more healing that's occurred. The skin can also crack, which is very painful and it can make it almost impossible to use your hands because every time you bend your fingers, they can crack. You can also get snake skin on the lips, which is thickened skin, hard, plastic-like skin that just sits on your lips and then no moisturizers can penetrate. TSW essentially is a vascular or a blood vessel issue. So these thermal images are not of the people who are in the photos down below, but it's interesting that they act as a map for areas which are typically affected by TSW. This is because the areas in the body with more blood vessels are warmer, so they show up on thermal imaging as being red. The other areas that show up as red are beneath the breast, around the belly button, around the thighs, and in the groin region, and these are all areas that are heavily affected in people with TSW. Here are just some other images, so you can see how it looks in other people. And on the left, you can see the clear nose and lips and mouth and the chest of the little boy, and it looks exactly like the thermal imaging. And then we've got a before and after of somebody who's in TSW and then when he's recovered. Here's another example as well. You can actually map the outline of major blood vessels and lymph nodes by looking at where the redness and swelling occurs in somebody in TSW, and especially in places like the legs because they are very vascular as well. This also happens around the eyes for the same reason. And areas which were once clear can start to fill in with redness and hyperpigmentation as the withdrawal runs its course. So it's not uncommon to find people literally covered from head to toe. It can mimic and act and feel like sunburn. And a very typical feature of TSW is something called red sleeves. It literally just looks like red sleeves with a demarcation along the wrist and clear palms. And here's a before and after. Some people do get symptoms on their hands and this is just some examples of how that can look. And this resolves upon recovery as well. So as we mentioned earlier, not everybody goes just red. So where you have red sleeves, you can also have black sleeves and brown sleeves and purple sleeves and tan sleeves and gray sleeves and red sleeves in people of color. This also happens at the feet and ankles. It looks how it behaves at the wrists and the palms with the demarcation. And interestingly, most people actually haven't had any pre-existing skin issues in these areas, but they tend to be very badly affected during TSW. And here are just some different people, different skin shades, so you can see a variation in redness and hyperpigmentation during TSW. The hyperpigmentation happens because you have an increased production of melanin cells when there's inflammation. It's not scarring, it's not permanent, and it does disappear after TSW just like the redness does. Here's just some examples of how it can look in people's backs. And then on the right here, you've got somebody at 10 months and then again at 21 months of TSW. You can have hypopigmentation and this normally happens in areas where there's lots of scratching. And you can actually map out the blood vessels by looking at the pattern of the redness and hyperpigmentation on the face. And you can see that on the right, the nose is clear and this is something really common. People nickname it the reverse Rudolph effect and it's just due to the position of the blood vessels. So let's have a look at the blood vessels and let's have a look at the patterns of the redness here. So you can see it matches up. You've even got the triangular redness here, which matches the veins around the eyes. And then you've got the line on the forehead too. So you really can quite literally map out the blood vessels if you look at the pattern of the flares and redness and hyperpigmentation in someone with TSW. Again, if you have a look at this area here, you can see the nose doesn't have the same vasculature as the rest of the head and neck. That's why it tends to stay clear. And then if we have a look at the back of the head, this area is actually rich in blood supply and lymph nodes, and it tends to be a very problematic area for people in TSW. Here are just some before and afters to show you that it does disappear without a trace. This total withdrawal time was 27 months. So, the way that hydrocortisone works <clears throat> is by constricting the blood vessels. This shrinks it away from the surface of the skin, which reduces the appearance of redness and it reduces inflammation. Now in TSW, the blood vessels dilate and then the fluid from inside the blood vessels, which is the plasma, leaks out of the blood vessels and it collects as swelling, as edema. And it can also leak out through the broken skin as oozing. 
you can see is another example of that here where the edema is happening underneath the skin but that's been compromised through uh, skin atrophy and then when there's been scratching and rubbing the ooze will just leak out. As we mentioned before the legs are very vascular, vascular and because of the effects of gravity when the fluid is pouring out of the blood vessels when you're standing they tend to pull in the feet and the ankles so then people can end up with lots of swelling around their ankles or their feet. It can be really uncomfortable especially if you're also having the burning and the itching and all of the other symptoms as well. But like all of the other symptoms so far it does recover. One of the most distressing places to have TSW symptoms is on the face. Let's have a look at everybody healing over time without any medical intervention. It is just a matter of giving it time. So the ooze can actually vary from being thin, clear and watery to being thick, yellow and sticky. Sometimes it's even tinged red with blood. Unfortunately, it can cause an unpleasant smell as well. It can even incur, occur inside of the ears, sometimes blocking them, and it can happen inside of the belly button as well. Antibiotics normally won't have any effect at all because this is not a bacterial infection, and all of these cases have resolved on their own without any medical intervention. It's just a matter of waiting for the blood vessels to heal. So just some tips. You can elevate your legs during the day when possible just to stop them from getting extra swollen. Again, with trying not to get things swollen, don't sleep lying down completely flat because then you'll have more pooling around your eyes and, and a swollen face in general. Um, sometimes as well, uh, while you're in this stage, you'll find that little cuts can actually bleed a lot more than normal. And that's just, that is normal for this sort of uh, stage of TSW, but then that does resolve over time. Now the ooze will settle on the skin as a yellow crust, which does look very concerning and people can mistake it for impetigo or infected eczema it will come back with elevated staph levels because we it's in our normal flora anyway and people who do have compromised skin in certain skin conditions will usually have high levels of staph but a lot of people who go for multiple courses of antibiotics don't see any difference because it's not a bacterial infection this is dried ooze that's coming from the inside of the blood vessels it's a different story if you have a bacterial infection alongside tsw that's different However, when you've left it to run its course, it recovers by itself. Another place that's very common for this to happen is around the mouth, and it's nicknamed the crustache, but then this also recovers over time. And the neck is also somewhere that's really common. Also to do with blood vessels, when they dilate inside the nose, they can cause a lot of congestion. This is vasomotor or non-allergic rhinitis, and it can come with the other nose-related symptoms as well, so sneezing, runny nose, you can snore as well. But this actually tends to resolve itself in TSW, especially for people who've stopped taking steroidal nasal sprays. I've just included here from the NHS website the side effects of steroidal nasal sprays, and it sounds very similar to TSW. Stinging and burning sensation in the nose, dryness and crustiness in the nose, dry irritated throat, an unpleasant taste in the mouth, itchiness, redness and swelling in the nose, nosebleeds, and if you're taking it for a long time it can even give you the same side effects as steroid tablets which include increased appetite, mood changes and difficulty sleeping. So this is just something to bear in mind. A lot of the most severe symptoms will occur in areas that have concentrated lymph nodes, so around the neck, behind the ears and the armpit and the groin. You can see here the pattern of the flare is following the lymph nodes and the blood vessels. And again, you can see this large lymph node here. You can map it out actually in the flare. And then even underneath the jaw, which tends to be a very problematic area for a lot of people. Around the ear is somewhere that is really problematic. And then you have on your face as well and then underneath the jaw, that's another example. It's really common to have very swollen lymph nodes, especially around the groin region, but these do resolve over time. So this is also something that can be very concerning when you see how it presents. A lot of the time it doesn't respond at all to antibiotics or any other medication. 
because it's not an infection. If you have a look at the picture here on the left, you can see she's actually still got clear forehead, nose, mouth and chin. And this also looks like the thermal imaging that we saw a few slides ago. But then over time, you can see in these progress pictures, the skin will recover and healing will occur by itself. This is another example of it drying by itself and clearing by itself. And all of these photos are of the same little boy. And you can see he's made beautiful progress. He's got a little bit left between his two fingers there on his right hand, but for the most part, he's doing really well with his recovery. And this is another example of somebody doing really well with their recovery after having looked like they have quite dramatic wounds and scabs. This would be a good time to talk about infection. So it can be difficult sometimes to differentiate between TSW and infection, but there are some ways that you can do this. The thing that will be common between the two is swollen and tender lymph nodes, but let's go from the top. So in TSW, you can give out a lot of body heat when your blood vessels are dilated, but this is different to the high temperature that you will be able to measure with a thermometer in, in an actual infection. In TSW, you will feel very fatigued, you won't feel great at all, but in infection, you will feel actually unwell and you might also feel like you want to vomit and you might actually vomit as well. In TSW, we already know that it's oozing and crusting from the dilated blood vessels. That's different to pus. Pus is something completely different. That is a sign of infection. In TSW, it's very normal to have fluctuations between being better and worse, even during a day, even during an hour. Whereas with infection, you actually tend to steadily get worse and deteriorate. So that's another telltale sign. As we've already mentioned in TSW, if it's not caused by a bacteria or any other microbe, it's not going to be responsive to medication. But if you do have an infection, then it should be responsive to antibiotics or whatever the appropriate medication is. If you or your child has eczema hepaticum, you need to see, seek medical attention immediately. This can actually lead to complications such as blindness and in rare cases, organ failure and even death. Most of what we go through isn't infection in TSW, but rather it's inflammation. So we have the pain and the heat, the redness and the swelling and the loss of function. You can also have eye complications, which are cataracts and glaucoma caused by using steroids. If you notice any visual changes, please do see your optician. So the functions of the skin via the nerves and blood vessels, there's quite a few. The ones that we're going to be looking at are how the skin acts as a sensory organ, transmitting pain, touch, pressure, itching and temperature, and how it helps to regulate the temperature as well. People in TSW who've gone for a nerve conduction tests have come back with the results that show extensive nerve damage. And this can be very jarring for both them and their doctors. But when you consider that we have more than a thousand nerve endings per square inch of skin, and that they are in such close conjunction with the blood vessels, as you can see in the photo, you can see why there's a lot of symptoms that we feel that are to do with nerve injury. Nerves are actually one of the slowest tissues to heal in the body. Nerve recovery actually can take months to years. And coincidentally, the same total time of uh, TSW recovery is also months to years. The bone deep itching is not to do with histamine. It is to do with nerve injury. That's why you feel like you want to claw your entire flesh off. It's a nerve thing. Also, the bugs crawling on the skin, that's to do with the nerves as well. Feeling hot and cold, overheating, being really cold, thermoregulation issues, again, to do with the nerves and the blood vessels. The burning in TSW is to do with the nerves and the pain. The zingers, electric shock type feelings, pins and needles and tingling. And being numb, that can happen because of nerve injury or because of the excess fluid pressing on the nerves. But either way, it's to do with the nerves. You can also have excessive or too little sweating and muscle twitching and shaking. Ice packs are useful against the burning feeling. Antihistamines are not. They're not useful for the uh, itching most of the time. Unless you separately have an allergic type itch, that can help. Uh, the antihistamines can help with that. But for the most part, people in TSW do get quite frustrated that antihistamines just do not work for the itch. And that's because it's a neuropathic itch, it's to do with the nerve cells misfiring. So it's not a histamine based itch. So if you're taking antihistamines and you don't have a histamine based itch, it's not what it doesn't have anything to work on. Whereas if you take an analgesic now, which is a painkiller like paracetamol or Tylenol, these actually act on the central and the peripheral nervous systems and they can help with relieving the itch and the other nerve related symptoms for a few hours. 
People have also taken gabapentin for nerve pain, but it's not recommended for frequent and or long-term use, any medication really. The itch is unavoidable, that is just the truth of the matter, and it can feel insatiable. So you can try to numb it with ice packs, but then if you must scratch, it's better to engage in safety scratching with a hairbrush or with artificial nails as some people like to do, because this actually helps to avoid breaking the skin, it gets to the itch and it stops your hands and your nails and your fingers, sorry, from cramping. It's best to keep your natural nails short because they can do a lot of damage. You can also feel extremely sensitive, and if people just walk past you, for instance, and there's a tiny breeze generated, it feels really sore on your skin. It's also really uncomfortable to wear clothes and to be around slight temperature changes, you'll be extra sensitive to it at this stage. So there is a stage in TSW where people love water and they love to sit in the bath for hours. It's the only thing that helps them with their symptoms. But unfortunately, there is another stage where it does feel like hot burning acid and you can actually leave the shower or the bath looking like you've been, how you've had some acid poured on all over you or you've been in a fire. When you're in this stage, it's best to limit water exposure as much as possible. And for children who can't vocalise it, I'll vocalise it for them. Please do not force them into the shower or the bath because the pain is terrible. It's not a phase that lasts forever and there are other ways to, to, uh, to try to help them to keep clean. But once the stage is over, then they can enjoy the bath and water again and it's going to be a pleasant experience for everyone. The same thing goes with moisturising. So moisturisers can either really help or they can really hurt. And sometimes something that works really well for you can be something that causes you the worst symptoms ever down the line. So I just avoid bulk buying and I would um, recommend that as well to people. Uh, sometimes you get to a stage where you actually can't tolerate anything at all on your skin. So you just stop moisturising altogether. And then when that happens, you actually feel less redness, itching, discomfort and burning. Some people have moisturised the entire way through and they've healed. Some people haven't moisturised at all and they've healed. Insomnia is definitely something that is a feature in TSW and sleep disturbance in general because most of the um, severe symptoms do happen at the night time. Uh, because the external source of cortisol has been stopped when you've stopped using steroids, there is a disruption to the circadian rhythm while your adrenal glands are readjusting. It goes without saying that if you're not sleeping well, you're going to have fatigue, you're going to be really tired, not to mention all of the changes that your body's going through. This can actually be unsafe, however, in terms of driving and also if your job involves putting yourself and other people at risk if you are tired, so that needs to be thought about. You can also feel extremely hungry and eat multiple amounts of food and this cannot affect your weight at all or you can put on weight or you can even actually lose weight while this is happening. This can come and go, but then it will resolve with recovery, but then People have also lost their appetite completely at times. With menstruation, you can have exacerbation of TSW symptoms before and during your menstrual cycles, sometimes also around ovulation, and you can have irregular menstrual cycles. Your periods can just disappear completely, or they can be completely fine and not affected for the entire time. There's a lot of hair issues with TSW. If it's not because the actual hair is getting thin and falling and you're getting bald, and you have a change to your curl pattern and the hair is breaking, it actually can be sometimes because the skin on your scalp is so compromised that the hair just falls out with it. It's really difficult to actually maintain your hair when your hands are so affected, and then you'll find the common patterns of receding hairline, and then you'll lo lose your eyebrows and your body hair. Not everybody, but most people do. And then some people do just prefer to shave their heads completely bald because it's easier and probably more comfortable that way if your scalp is affected. Hair does grow back. So some of the later stages of TSW, people report having hives quite a lot, and also in areas where your skin was quite affected by the TSW flares, you can find large pores, but then these do shrink over time. You'll also find lots of whiteheads collecting in areas where you might have had oozing, but then again, this resolves upon recovery. And needless to say, after seeing all of that, I don't think it's surprising for anyone if I say that it is something that's very difficult for your mental health. It is something that is so mentally taxing, not to mention the emotional side, the physical side, just it's a lot to deal with for both the people who are going through it and their loved ones around them. 
it doesn't help that they, there is a severe amount of gaslighting that we receive from medical professionals when we are exhibiting all of these symptoms and we are blamed for them. We are told that TSW doesn't exist. We are told that we need to use more steroids. And what can happen a lot of the time as well is unfortunately when children are going through TSW, the authorities can intervene and remove them from the home because it's seen to be neglectful parenting as they are not uh, agreeing with the doctor's treatment plan. Even though it's the treatment that has brought them to where they are in the first place, but it has happened where kids have been taken off their parents, so that is really difficult. Relationships have a huge strain on them if they last. A lot of them do break apart. Um, it's possible to go through the five stages of grief more than once, even if you've reached acceptance before, because TSW is just so uncertain. And sometimes when you think you've come to the end, you have another flare all over again. There's a lot of guilt that can be felt by parents for taking their children to the doctors and for having the steroid creams put on them in the first place. But you are just doing what a responsible, loving and caring parent would have done by taking your child to the doctors and listening to their advice. So do not be harsh on yourself. Also, it's really difficult to be able to make any plans because you just don't know when you're going to flare again. It can lead to depression, even suicidal thoughts, and just not being able to recognize yourself physically and mentally. It's a lot for someone to deal with. So let's have a look at some examples of TSW. It's normal for babies to have rashes. i so a lot of people um, worry when they see babies and they've got rashes and they want to just have something to put on them to get rid of the rash straight away. But babies can literally be born with rashes. As they're discovering the world, they can have rashes pop up and it goes away. As they are weaning and trying solid foods for the first time, they'll have rashes and then they'll go away. It's normal. It, in the terms of uh, dribble or drool rash and uh, nappy rash, it's much better to avoid them from happening in the first place such as using a barrier or wiping away the body fluids, rather than controlling it using a steroid. Because for babies and in their face and the genital region, these are three categories which steroids should not go anywhere near at all. Let's have a look at what happened in a baby who had mild eczema patches. You see these two little eczema patches on the torso before using steroid creams. So he was given steroid creams to uh, treat these patches and this was the result. Okay, you can see the skin changes, you can see all of the rashes. In the middle picture, look at the hands with the pooling blood. He did make a recovery, but it's something very traumatic for himself and his family to have gone through. So this is why awareness is needed for TSW. So in the case of this toddler, he actually didn't have any skin conditions. Uh, he didn't have eczema or anything like that. What happened with him is that he went to daycare and then all of the kids came down with a viral rash and they had a fever and everything. His paediatrician actually put him on quite a high dose hydrocortisone uh, to begin with. And then after he used it for the designated time period, he ended up getting TSW symptoms. Then he was given triamcinolone. And then after stopping that, he ended up deteriorating. He was shaking and he was feeling very cold all the time. Because of croup, he used a dose of prednisone, which is an oral systemic steroid. And this was the result. You can quite clearly see this is not eczema. And then he began his recovery upon stopping steroids. This is 19 months since stopping. You can see in this dog, she's exhibiting all of the symptoms of TSW. And let's take a look at this dog as a case. So as a puppy, he had an itchy rash, which would go away when the vet gave them a steroid shot, and then it would come back worse than the first time and it would spread. So this happened multiple times before the owner eventually stopped taking him to the vets. She knows somebody who went through TSW and so she realized that it looked and sounded a lot like what he went through. <clears throat> Once she stopped taking the dog to the vet and he didn't have the storage shots anymore, his itching worsened, his legs sw uh, got swollen to twice their original size and he developed open wounds and crusts and he also had adverse reactions to water. Sounds familiar? But he did make a complete recovery after several months. And here's an example of TSW from non-topical corticosteroids. So this lady actually did have eczema, but she never used steroids as her mum controlled it with diet. 
Then as an adult, she had a bike accident and then she had steroid shots put into her shoulder. Shortly after that, she was diagnosed with having arthritis, which was then treated with eight weeks of systemic steroids. And then after that, unfortunately, she had an eye infection, used steroid eye drops for five days, and exactly five days after stopping them, she had TSW, as you can see in the photos. She tried to clear it with diet, as she was used to doing from when she was young. It didn't work. So for the first time in her life, she was given topical steroids over the phone by a doctor, medium potency. She didn't receive any warnings. The symptoms did clear within two days, but after two weeks, she tried to stop taking the topical steroids and her symptoms got worse than ever before. After a few months, she ended up getting this infection. When she visited the doctor, they wanted to give her more steroids without taking a swab. And when she tried to tell them about TSW, she was dismissed as that being nonsense. It doesn't exist. And then after she stopped taking the steroids, she got even worse than she ever was before. Currently, she's at around 14 months of withdrawal <clears throat> and she has been left with dryness and elephant skin, still in recovery, but much better than before. So just to recap on TSW, it is not eczema, it is not an allergic reaction, it is iatrogenic, meaning it's caused by the medical treatment, it is preventable, it can be severely debilitating, taking months to years to clear completely, but the good news is that it is temporary. Doctors can't treat what they don't know. The most important thing is diagnosis. And if this is something that they are not previously aware of, then they can only use the tools available to them and the training that they have and what they are familiar with to try and help you in the way that they are best able to. Please do not try to stress yourself out trying to figure out what exactly is causing this symptom and that symptom because for the most part, it is just going to run its course. And that goes for also trying to shorten the withdrawal time. Think about it like a broken leg. If you break a leg, it's going to take a certain number of weeks before, it's, before it uh, recovers. You can't suddenly decide that you're going to heal over a weekend by changing your regime or your diet or, you know, all of these things. Like, it will just run its course. TSW is a drug withdrawal. It's not an allergy and it's not an autoimmune disorder. The most important thing to come away from this with is treat TSW like TSW, not like eczema. Treating it like eczema is what got most of us here in the first place and it's not going to be helpful or beneficial. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful to you. Here are my references and this has been an overview of TSW.